A peaceful dialogue between a Hindu and a Muslim part 2. Question 10. Hindu, why does Islam prohibit the doctrine of the incarnation of God in any of the human beings, images, statues, cows, other animals and creatures and thus forbid sanctifying any of them and prohibiting their worship? Answer 10. Muslim, firstly, I will explain the doctrine of incarnation and the union, the presence of God in idols, statues, animals, etc. and becoming one, leads to division and non-unity. It also leads to believe in the existence of the Creator God and different images of His creatures each according to His desires dash. This person may see that God's incarnation and the union are in the sun, stars and planets and another may recognize Him in cows and other animals while others notice Him in idols. Statues and Stones In addition, others see Him in trees and plants. There are those who see Him in everything, including unclean stinking places. I have answered the previous question that there is a difference between the Creator and the creature and that there is no equality between two opposite kinds of stuff at all. Therefore, the claim that both are the same is injustice and a big insult from the creature to the Creator. From there, we will ask. I sit fitting for the exalted Almighty God the one who is far from lacking and defecting and he is attributed with all qualities of perfection to merge with some of his creatures? Assuredly, it is no. Is it fitting for Almighty God to be present in a person who sleeps, urinates, defecates, and carries dirty, unclean feces in his belly? Is it fitting for the dear, living God, who will not die, to incarnate into a mortal man, and then, after his death, he will become a stinking corpse? Undoubtedly, it is no. Is it fitting for Almighty God to be in a humiliating, fragile, and perishable statue made by a weak creature? Certainly, it is no. I sit fitting for Almighty God to be in a cow which urinates, excretes, and carries blood, dung, and impurity in its belly, and then it is destined to slaughter or death and become a stinking prey? Surely, it is no. Is it appropriate to Almighty Greatest God to be in an inferior beast such as mouse and others? This is absurd, and it is absolute no. I sit suitable for Almighty God to be in everything and then be present in the unclean and filthy places? Sure, no. The doctrine that God is inside his creatures, his possessions, and that he united with them makes everything in this universe to be worthy of worship? Or in a more precise sense, it means there is no difference between the creator and the creature. Undoubtedly, this is negation to the greatest right of Allah, his unique divinity. Furthermore, it is controversy to Almighty Allah's sanctity. Let us ask in another way, is it fitting for a person after being blessed by God with the grace of brains and favored him upon all his creatures to worship something weaker than him such as a statue or an animal which does not have the slightest intellect and has no harm, no benefit, no death, no life, and no resurrection? Surely it is no. What if a man tries to break and destroy that statue that he worships and thinks that God is inside it? Will it prevent him from breaking, destroying, and ruining it? Exactly, it is no. What about after doing so and it cannot defend itself from destruction? What is the condition of the God that he believed it was inside that statue? Will that God still be inside it or run away? If he thinks that the God is inside that broken stuff, why he did not protect it from being broken? What about if a man tries to slaughter the worshipped cow which he thinks his God is inside it? Will that claimed God fight for killing it? Of course, it is no. What about after slaying in it and it could not defend itself? What is the situation of the God that lives inside it? Will it still be inside it or move away? If he thinks that God is present in it after destroying in it and changing to the stinking dead body, why did not it secure it from being ruined? Does it suit a reasonable intellectual mature person to worship something due to the advantage that he wants to benefit from it? Of course, it is no. However, what fits a wise person is to worship God who created that thing and put benefit in it. This God is Almighty Allah. Therefore, it does not fit Almighty Allah's wisdom and greatness to create something vainly. All the creatures of Allah have their advantages either we do not know it or see it. Also, each has its role in securing the system and balance of the environment. For this reason, who deserves to be worshipped is the originator of causes that is Allah the benefactor creator instead of worshipping the causes themselves. This is what makes sense. 
At last, let us ask at this point, why does God need to be inside any human being which is one of his creatures, and any one of the produced statues, or those created cows? Does he need to do that? Absolutely, he doesn't because he demands nothing from any one of his creatures. It is the creatures that need their creator. Is there minimum evidence accepted by the brain, by which Almighty Allah blessed human, to such a thing? Certainly, no, it is an illusion that has nothing to do with reality. Does the person who wants to approach his God, worship him and beg him need to buy or manufacture a statue of stone and the like in a form or a certain image in order to let God be present in it? Or to go to one of cows, peeing, excreting and carrying blood, dung and impurities in her stomach, to worship it, call it and pray to it? What is the need if the second person wants to get closer to his God and Creator? Worship him and call him to buy or manufacture another statue of stone and the like in a form and another image in order to let God be inside it or to go to another one of cows to worship it. Call it pray to it? Do not we believe that the Creator God must be great in himself? His qualities and actions and that it is not appropriate to attribute to him any defects and imperfections or any of the ugly forbidden deeds? Therefore, he, the exalted, will never do trivialities and imperfections. The answer is yes. Then, it is necessary for us to purify Almighty God from all that does not fit him such as believing that he is present in one of his creatures because that is an attribute of imperfection for him. Question 11, Hindu, did you know that the Hindus reduce many gods to three major gods or say that these gods are a single god with three images or hypostasis? What is the view of Islam in this? Answer 11, Muslim, firstly, I know that there are among Hindus who worship three major gods, some worship 33 gods, other worship 1,000 gods, and some of them worship 330 million gods. In addition, many Hindus reduce these many gods to three main gods or say that these gods are one god with three images and hypostasis, which is as follows. God Brahma. He is the creator, according to their belief. God Vishnu, they call him the protector where they say that his mission is to preserve the world. God Shiva, the god of destroying, finishing, and devastating. He is the destructive of the world and its mission opposes Vishnu's. To sum up, they say that it is only the god Brahma that creates and not other two gods, the god Vishnu brings goodness and not other two gods, and evil is done by the god Shiva and not by other gods. As for Islamic perspective in that belief, it explained. Firstly, the belief that there is a god with three images or hypostasis is actually a belief that there are three different gods and not one god since each of them is believed to be one god from the other so. That he has his own personality and his special role. Then, saying that three gods are one is an explicit violation of reasonableness and astonishment of its necessities. Secondly, I have made clear through the evidence in my fifth answer to the question that indicates that God, the creator, protector, and controller of the universe, is only one God, not two, three, or more. Hence, Islam has come to call for faith in the one God who alone has to act in this universe and no one else is like that, so there is only one Almighty God, Allah. Question 12, Hindu, did you know that the Hindu religion has a doctrine called after, which means God came down to the earth in the form of a human image representing in the personality of so-called Krishna for knowing the conditions of his creation. For the purpose of teaching people and reforming them? What is the view of Islam in this? Answer 12, Muslim, yes, I know that the Hindu religion has the doctrine of the after, which means in detail. The god Vishnu, which Hindus call the protector who they regard him for being responsible for the preservation of the world, came in the human image of Krishna which is painted as a cowboy or a prince offering philosophical guidance. They said that his death was then due to his injury from a fisherman with a poisoned arrow by mistake. There are many different perceptions about the character of Krishna in Hinduism but ultimately agree on the divine incarnation. As for Islamic perspective in that belief, it explained. Islam has come to call for the glorification of Almighty God and the belief in the great and beautiful qualities and limitless of His power. Among of what it calls for is the belief in His vast wide complete knowledge that encompasses everything. He knows everything either place or time, past, present, future. 
Therefore, Allah does not need to be present in a human form to exist in the midst of his creation in order to know their news and conditions. That does not fit him. Islam is called to purify Almighty Allah from all that does not fit him. Therefore, he will never do any acts of trivialities and imperfections. Describing him with incarnation in an image of a weak person power in order to know the conditions of his creation, guidance, or education cannot downgrade him in his ability. Concern and position because he is attributed with unlimited. This is not appropriate to Almighty God. Islam is called to purify God from what is not fitting for him in terms of faulty and disrespectful attributes. Not only that, but also what is not appropriate for him, such as the actions of humans' needs and other creatures like eating, drinking and excreting including sleeping, resting. Marriage and giving birth. Almighty Allah does not need anything like that. To clarify in more detail, let us consider. To clarify in more detail, let us consider. I said fitting for Almighty God to become a sperm for a man among his creatures in order to enter into the womb of a woman and stay in between flesh and blood and then turn from one stage to another. Until it becomes a fetus then a baby and at last a child. After that, they deal with him as a person in the form of a human? It is certainly no because there is no relation between both of them. Therefore, there is the difference between the deity and the human. Allah does not do trivialities, because that means that he has thus abandoned the attributes of divinity. Can human nature meet with animal nature? Surely, it is no. Is it possible to accept that a man marries a cow or other kinds of animals to give birth to half a human being and the other half a cow, or other animals, and then the baby has animal nature and human image? Can any reasonable person accept that? Certainly, no, it is a moral degeneration and a diminution of the dignity of human being who was honored by Almighty Allah. Humans are more dignified and superior to animals, although they are all creatures of God. If that is the case concerning the human nature and animals although both are creatures, so what if the matter is related to Almighty God who is unique with divinity? Can the divine nature meet with human nature, the weak creature born from his mother's private part and becomes a baby in need of embrace and care? Who will be destined to die and be buried afterwards like other creatures, or else to be human nature or other embodiment of the divine image? Certainly, no, this is slander about Almighty God, derogation for him and a reduction in his ability. Hence, Islam is called to purifying Allah from the act of trivialities and imperfections. Allah is the one indivisible God. He did not give birth and he was not born. Also, he has no equivalent, similar, or comparable. Question 13. Hindu. It is among Hindus who say that we worship Rama or Krishna and the like gods because they guided us to God. What is the view of Islam in that? Answer 13. Muslim. Firstly, I know that there are Hindus who say that when we worship God who is embodied in the form of human beings, we mean the worship of God. I had explained in the previous answer that Islam has come to call for purifying Almighty God from what does not fit him. Therefore, he is not in need of doing trivialities and imperfections. Nothing can downgrade his status as the most powerful God. So he will not be in the form of a weak creature on the grounds in order to know the conditions of his creation, to guide them and teach them. That is not appropriate for him as I had explained earlier. Secondly, Question, Islam has come out indicating that God has sent many of his prophets and messengers to call people to believe in him. To guide them and to illustrate for them the uniqueness of his divinity, his great qualities and his unrestrained power. Moreover, they came with other tasks such as teaching people manner of acting in their lives. Is it reasonable to worship the prophets and messengers because they guided people to believe in Almighty Allah and introduced him to them? It is certainly, no, since that involves having a partner with God, as I explained earlier. In addition, it is contrary to the original call of the prophets and messengers, which is to call to have faith in the one God, who is Almighty Allah. Thirdly, Islam can never accept the idea of the incarnation of God in the form of man. As this leads to the belief in the divine incarnation and then the divinity of many people as in the case of different nations, each according to their own desires. For this reason, people sanctify and worship them by claiming that they are different images of the divine incarnation in the form of human beings. 
That belief is polytheism because of the dispute in his greatest right, whereas he is unique in his divinity. He must be worshipped alone without other human beings or any of his creatures. Question 14. Hindu. Hindus burn the bodies of their dead people, while Muslims bury the human body after his death in the soil instead of burning. Why? What is the right view that Islam sees in this? Answer 14. Muslim. At first, the Muslims bury the bodies of the dead because of the implementation of Allah's orders which he inspired to the prophets and messengers to be reported to the people and to follow. As for what you are asking about the correctness of this method of burial, I will explain to you from the humanitarian, economic, and scientific point of view. Uh, from a humanitarian point of view. The burning of the bodies after their death and then throwing them after burning them in a river, the Ganges River according to the Hindu rituals, and making them vulnerable to the destruction and eating of dogs, predatory animals, and birds of prey after becoming floating and moved by water movement to any of the beaches. It makes them bodies of inferior value while Islam is working carefully on the dignity of the alive and dead human being. It looks at his body after his death in a respectful and honored way. Therefore, we find that one of the teachings of Islam is to deal carefully with the bodies of the dead to avoid the slightest harm to it until it is placed in his grave and buried therein. Taking into account the kindness of his burial. In addition, the human soul feels scorn for such a harsh scene that burns dead bodies and then leaves them in danger of being subjected to harm, destruction, and eating of dogs. Predators and Birds of Prey B. In terms of economics, burning bodies of the dead are very expensive, including the waste of natural resources such as trees and plants. Where certain types of wood are used in the process of burning while burying the human body after death in a grave does not entail any of that cost. C. In scientific point of view. The burning of bodies of the dead is the cause of the spread of pollution, epidemics. Diseases and damage to the ecosystem and imbalance as a result of the pollution of rainwater and rivers and the damage to humans, animals, trees, and plants. While burying the human body after his death in the ground does not entail anything such as that pollution. Hence, the wisdom of Islamic law is revealed in its legislation to bury the human body after its death in the soil instead of burning it. Question 15. Hindu. Did you know that the Hindu religion says a doctrine called reincarnation of souls, which means the transfer of human spirit after death to another body? What is the view of Islam in this? Answer 15. Muslim. Yes, I know that the Hindu religion says the doctrine of the reincarnation of souls, which means in detail. The return of the human spirit after death to another body, to one of the animals such as dogs and pigs, to one of the insects, trees, or non-living things. All is according to his work to get his rewards in another body in the world. If he is good, he will enjoy in that body that he returned to, and if he is evil, he will be tortured. It stems from the doctrine of reincarnation, according to the Hindu religion. A. Karma's doctrine, any law of reward and punishment, which means that the offender is rewarded and punished by putting his soul in the body of a naughty person to suffer in it. B. Nirvana Doctrine, the survival of successive cycles of reincarnation, in which the soul moves to other bodies, for its validity in the previous sessions. Then, Nirvana will happen to it meaning that the spirit unites with the God. As for the Islamic perspective concerning that belief, it explained. Islam came to call for faith in the existence of the last day in which the creatures are resurrected after their death. Where the soul returns to the body of its owner again after Almighty Allah recreates his body. After that, there will be accountancy with great compensation and reward in an enjoyable eternal life for doing good and severe punishment in a naughty life for doing evil. Therefore, that, Islamic, view urges people to strive in doing good and adherence to soundness, high principles, and praised morals, and to let them give up the evil deeds. From what I have pointed out, it appears that Islam does not agree to the claim of the reincarnation of life and then it opposes to the belief of the union of the created spirit with the creator God. Furthermore, this important question which works to clarify the matter clearly confirms what Islam said, as follows. Let us ask, did any human being feel anything from the life of the previous spirit that he lived in another body before, according to the Hindu religion? Did he remember anything about it? In order to reach a high degree of credibility in the answer, let this question be directed to different races of non-Hindus such as Europe, Africa, North and South America, Australia, and Asia. 
Since we do not find anyone to feel such a life, it confirms that the statement of the reincarnation of life is only a baseless assumption. A new kind of answer may be used as if there are new birthdays for many people, so it is not necessarily that every human being has a previous life. The response to this is very easy since the absence of any human being to feel such life illustrates the invalidity of the reincarnation case and then affirms the invalidity of the union of the created spirit with the creator God. In addition, if it is agreed that the human spirit after his death is transmitted to animals and trees, etc. from which the man benefits, which serves as a reward for his sins and punishment for his wrong deeds. Therefore, that assumption will be a reason for not leaving sins in order to multiply such animals and trees because of their usefulness and importance to humans. There is no doubt that there is a contradiction between what the Hindu religion called to and its belief in the call to leave sins and adhere to good morals. Moreover, if it is accepted that the spirit of the human transmits after his death to the poor, sick and disabled people as a reward for the human sins and punishment for his bad deeds, that will cause bad thinking towards these fellows and those who are like them. For that, people will think that they are in this miserable situation because of their sins and wrongdoing in the previous life. There is no doubt that this is unacceptable morally, humanely, and mentally. According to the previous illustration, the complete conformity has appeared between what is acceptable morally, humanely, and mentally, and the call of Islam. The belief in the day of judgment when people will be resurrected after their death lets them struggle in doing good and adherence to soundness. High principles and praised morals also abandoning suspicion towards the others and to let them give up the evil deeds. Question 16. Hindu, why does Islam call to the belief in the last day when people will be resurrected after their death? Answer 16. Muslim, firstly, the knowledge of the existence of the last day in which the creatures are resurrected after their death to get the great reward and compensation for doing good, paradise including permanent stable enjoyment, and to receive the painful punishment of evil, hellfire including awful forfeiture, leads to diligence in good deeds and adherence to valued, high principles, good morals, and abandoning the opposite of that which are bad evil deeds. It is the wisdom of Almighty Allah to make the last day in which people will be held for accountancy. That is because if there is no afterlife for the reward, there will not be a logical reason to show the human morality and good qualities such as truth and honesty if adhering to them will contradict the worldly benefit. It means that the human being has good morals and qualities and stick to them although adhering to them may oppose his worldly interest at times and positions in order to get Allah's bounty. To fear his punishment and to hope for his compensation in the hereafter. Also, if someone has caused the killing of thousands of people, how is he to be held for accountancy for those crimes, and how will the victims get their rights if there is no the day of resurrection and reckoning? This life is not enough to discipline him because the maximum punishment for him in this world is killing, which is only a punishment for one human life that he has caused its killing. Then, what about the rest of the human souls that have not taken their rights and retaliation? Another example is that when a person presents himself to be killed in order to save another person's life, when defending him, this behavior is a good praised moral. Here is a question, is it enough logically for a person to lose his life in order to be praised for good morals, and then there is no reward for this great work done by this noble creation? Or does he sacrifice himself and his life to get Allah's reward for his nice deed? This is because Allah has urged man to show this marvelous behavior and other good qualities and promise to reward him on the day of resurrection, the day in which people will be raised up for the Account for awarding, honoring, and entering paradise if he does this work because of him and for glorifying his teachings. There is no doubt that the logical answer is that the person sacrificed himself and his life according to what Allah has enjoined upon him and to be rewarded. He also expected his promise for his reward on the Day of Resurrection. According to this explanation, it is clear to us the need for the day of retribution for every human soul to retaliate for whom were killed and harmed by murderers and criminals and to punish the latter with what they deserve. Also, he will compensate the work of saving the human soul. Thus, it becomes clear to us the wisdom of God to make this last day for accountancy, the reckoning, and the punishment. In addition, it proves the credibility of Islam's call for believing in the last day.